peripherally vasoconstrict arterioles. Peripherally vasoconstrict veins. You'll get an arterial vasoconstriction and you'll get a venous vasoconstriction. You'll also get increased cardiac output via the mechanisms of increased heart rate and increased stroke volume. Now all the time there's pressure in the aorta and the carotid arteries, there's going to be impulses going up the vagus nerve and up the glossopharyngeal nerve towards the vasomotor centre. And the higher the blood pressure, the more nervous impulses are going to go from the baroreceptors to the brainstem. So when the blood pressure is high, there's going to be a lot of impulses going up to the brainstem. When the blood pressure is low, there's less impulses go from the baroreceptors to the brainstem. Now when the blood pressure is high and there's a lot of impulses going to the brainstem, then these impulses from the baroreceptors inhibit the sympathetic outflow from the brainstem. So the higher the pressure, the more impulses going up to the brainstem via the vagus and glossopharyngeal nerve, the less impulses leaving the brainstem to bring blood pressure up. And that makes sense. If the blood pressure is already high, you don't want it to go higher. However, if the blood pressure drops, then there's going to be less impulses going up the vagus nerve, less impulses going up the glossopharyngeal nerve from the baroreceptors. And if there's less impulses from the baroreceptors going into the brainstem, the brainstem will automatically increase its sympathetic outflow to vasoconstrict arteries and veins and increase cardiac output, so restore blood pressure. So let's just review what's going on here. Blood pressure is detected in the aorta and carotid arteries, detected by the baroreceptors. When the pressure's high, impulses travel in the baroreceptors to the brainstem, which inhibits the outflow of the brainstem. However, if the blood pressure drops, less impulses travel up the nerves to the brainstem. So there is less inhibition of the vasomotor center by baroreceptor impulses. Therefore, there will be an increased sympathetic outflow from the brainstem to raise blood pressure. Just before we leave this section on the vasomotor center, I want to mention three other factors which can influence its activity. Now the first one I want to mention is influence from the higher centers. Now what we mean by this is influence on the vasomotor center from higher centers in the brain, from the cerebrum, from the areas of consciousness. So for example, if someone's under stress or angry, this will tend to increase the activity of the vasomotor center, therefore increase blood pressure. Or if someone's anxious, you know when you're anxious, your heart's beating fast, you can feel your heart beating. These are effects of the vasomotor center increasing blood pressure when you are anxious. So those higher effects can raise blood pressure, but higher effects can also lower blood pressure. If you get an emotional shock, if, if something really upsets you that you see in the environment round about you, then, then that can cause an individual to faint. That, and a faint is caused by an acute cerebral hypoperfusion, an acute reduced blood perfusion of the brain, and, and that will cause the individual to faint. It's nothing to worry about as long as you lie them down and, uh, and let them come around gradually, then just carry on with whatever uh, you, you are doing. The key thing with fainting is not to get, get anxious and get a complex about it because it, it passes off with time. But it's important to notice that effects of the higher centre can either increase or reduce blood pressure. Now the next one I want to mention is clinically quite important. When the levels of oxygen in the blood start to drop, 
if a, if a patient is becoming hypoxic. Then this will stimulate the activity of the vasomotor center to increase blood pressure. The heart will go faster and the blood will be going around the body much more quickly. Now the reason for this, if you think about it, is to try and compensate for the hypoxia. It's a compensatory mechanism because remember it's the oxygen that carries the blood round about the body. And if there's not enough oxygen in the tissues of the body, one way to compensate for that is to have more blood going around the tissues to try and carry more oxygen to those tissues. So in the early stages of hypoxia, it's normal to get an increased heart rate and increased blood pressure. The last one I want to mention is reduced levels of carbon dioxide. When the levels of carbon dioxide in the blood are low, this will do the opposite. It will reduce the activity of the vasomotor center and therefore blood pressure will be lowered. So low levels of oxygen can increase blood pressure. Low levels of carbon dioxide can reduce blood pressure. So remember higher influences, low levels of oxygen, high, uh, low levels of carbon dioxide again can all have influences on the vasomotor center and therefore on blood pressure. Now remember we're still thinking about normal blood pressure and we've looked at neuronal control, the influence of the nervous system. The next area of control of normal blood pressure I want to look at are endocrine factors, hormonal factors. And the first one I want to talk about is the renin-angiotensin mechanism. Now this all begins when there's a reduced blood flow to the kidney. So if the blood pressure in the kidney drops, that's where this story starts. So we'll start off with a renal hypoperfusion. If for any reason the blood supply to the kidney is reduced. So if there's a drop in blood pressure, the pressure of the blood entering the kidney will be reduced. So here's the kidney and it can detect reduced blood pressure entering the kidney. Now this is actually detected, as far as I understand it, in the ju juxta glomerular cells in the afferent arteriole. So the afferent arteriole on the kidney recognizes that the blood pressure is being reduced. Now it's very important for the kidney to have a regular, have a good blood pressure of blood going into it because the blood pressure is necessary to facilitate the process of glomerular filtration, which is essential to urine production. So the kidney in a sense is kind of looking after its own blood supply. So it detects if there's a renal hypoperfusion. And the juxtaglomerular cells in the walls of the afferent arterioles respond by releasing a hormone called renin. That is, they will release renin when the blood pressure to the kidney drops. So when there's a renal hypoperfusion, the kidney detects that and it produces renin. So the kidney produces renin, an endocrine hormone. Now, all the time in the plasma, there's a plasma protein. And the plasma protein is called angiotensinogen. So angiotensinogen is present in the blood. It's a plasma protein. And it's fairly inactive. It doesn't do very much. However, if angiotensinogen is converted into angiotensin, and in fact the type of angiotensin the angiotensinogen is converted into is called angiotensin 1, the first type of angiotensin. This is a protein, the angiotensinogen is a protein. Angiotensin is a, is a peptide, it's a, a polypeptide, it's actually